internet and usage we also still have uh, the rural and urban you know gap so all these really affect our meaningful uh, uh, access to the internet uh, we see a lot of uh, uh, pushback uh, for a few that try to access the internet for instance the cyber uh, security we have increased uh, uh, rate of uh, digital divide uh, I mean increased rate of online gender-based violence online harassment these are some of the things that are pushing back women young girls who are supposed to meaningfully participate in the online uh, spaces we still have uh, affordability problem uh, many girls and many women many youth are not able to uh, to afford the internet because of the high rates of uh, high, high cost of internet data and also the devices uh, the GMs, the GSMA report still shows that uh, when we look at uh, the internet data at least affordability has increased but when we look at the devices so many people still cannot afford so some of these things uh, some of these issues are still <coughs> affecting the meaningful connectivity uh, you know or for, for the youth uh, for the women for the girls so thank you thank you very much peace I'll be going I mean we have um, in in terms of connectivity and digital rights we know that we cannot work without um, good policies and sometimes these policies and laws are pushed by uh, our parliament and it's good we have a parliamentarian here who is also an ICT professional in the person of Honorable Halajan Boop to give his perspective on connectivity and digital rights and um, um, what you're doing so far in terms of legislation that can be eliminated by other um, countries in the global south. Over to you Halaji. Um, yes, thank you, thank you very much. Um, like the um, moderator said, my name is Honorable Alajimbo, I'm a member of parliament from the Gambia and the Pan-African Parliament. I'm the uh, chairperson also of the ICT committee in the Gambia and also a co-founder of the African Parliamentary Network on Internet Governance. Now, you know, when we look at the, the connectivity across the, well, across the continent or I can say um, uh, the global south, um, you're going to realize that there's still now a big disparity. That is, even within the countries themselves, there is a big disparity in terms of connectivity. Now, um, the issue here we have, whether it's, it's a policy-based issue or not, but you're going to realize that actually there's a lot that we can do as far as policy making is concerned. Um, most of the investors actually in the ICT sector um, uh, is private-based, meaning they are there to, to get to make money. Now, and some of the strategies that we have, or some of the policies that we actually have in this, some of our countries actually, um, uh, they are not actually creating a good level playing field um, uh, because again when policies are unpredictable um, you're going to realize that investors also may be affected in terms of really what they want to invest in particular countries so the predictability of um, uh, you know strategies that government is going to come up with is by and large also has a lot to do with whether um, institutions want to invest in the in the you know in the ICT sector and again the investment actually is, is intensive um, uh, and people want to make sure that if they're going to put a penny, at least they'll be able to get return on their investment. So um, uh, at this point, you're going to realize that there are a lot of issues dealing with policy issues um, across the continent and also in the, in the global south. And, and I think parliaments actually have a great deal um, to work with the executive to ensure that there are policies or the policies that are in place would actually help to build innovation, but not actually to you know, stifle innovation. And uh, um, again, um, as parliamentarians, this I think that we really need to work on. And uh, we are also um, working with our executive to ensure that we have those policies in place to ensure that institutions actually have the uh, right uh, mentality and also, above all, the conducive environment to be able to operate instead of actually putting policies or laws that would actually stifle them. So you want to put in policies or strategy that would actually allow them to be really very confident to be also uh, to ensure they can able to um, uh, you know invest in those areas so that they can try to close the digital gap. Because for the most part, you're going to realize that almost 3.7 billion people actually are not connected. And uh, um, again, um, a majority of them are actually in the global south. Which means the digital divide actually is real. And also within countries themselves, you're going to realize that there could be, you know, connectivity, but access also issues, you know. Again, like the other speaker actually has said, that actually also has to do with the cost 
of getting those internet connections from our mobile devices or from any other device that you can have. So those are also areas that policy can actually actually change. Um, because again, when you leave everything in the hands of the you know private sector, again, you realize that they are there to make money. But policies could be there in place to ensure that at least not only making money, but they also have to think about those that are in the rural communities, um, um, uh, so that they were able to to be connected, you know, you know, you know, properly, so they can have access. So, um, um, uh, um, but as far as the parliament is concerned, I think um, there's a need for us to look at our policies and then to work with the executive to ensure that we know we have the right policies in place, um, uh, so that we're gonna, um, you know, uh, promote innovation. Thank you. Thank you um, very much, Hon Honorable Halajun Bob. I'll move, I'll, before I move to Teres Keita from Joko Labs Banjo um, to give her perspective, I'll move over to Zaniwe Asari. Um, she's the chairperson of the um, South African Internet Governance Forum and she also sits on the African Tax Force with me. So Zaniwe will be looking at it from the perspective of um, digital rights within the context of South Africa and connectivity. Over to you Zaniwe. Thank you so much. Um, so as, as mentioned, my name is Zanyuen Tatisi Asare. I am an advocate of the High Court of South Africa. I sit on the Zambia Technology Sector Working Group. And I also, I think I'll, I'll be, give more perspective from um, my experience under the Independent Communications Authority of South Africa's Consumer Advisory Panel that really does look at the issues that we're discussing today. Um, I'm going to leave this alone and just, I think, speak from my heart because it's a very human-centric topic. Um, so the work that we do as the Consumer Advisory Panel really looks at connecting the unconnected, going into rural South, South Africa, and um, acknowledging the fact that when we look at data, um, at least from a static perspective, and I think I'll speak about that um, holistically because we do, well, I do work there, but I also do work outside of South Africa in the static region, is that um, the data that we get that informs us to create solutions isn't the cleanest data, it's not the most reliable and um, I, 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 a lot of the times I can't really pinpoint why because we can go to these areas and we, we can talk to the people but there is some kind of disconnect and what this effectively does is it misguides us when it comes to identifying real gaps that we create solutions for so you end up mismatching um, the solutions for the problems on the ground so for instance we're still dealing with a lot of you know second um, industrial revolution and third industrial revolution based issues if you look at solution making um, now let's go to the South African context as I as I had mentioned so what we would do is literally go into communities and understand what the leadership structures or formation looks like because those are the people that would typically tell you what's really happening on the ground. So looking at traditional leaders, looking at um, gathering people quite similar to what we're doing today and having real discussions. A lot of the times there needs to be a liter literacy transfer because when you go and you speak to people who have not really interacted with um, information communication technologies at a level that most of the people in this room have, when you ask questions they won't give you the right answers. And by right answers I mean answers that are going to lead you to give, giving them proper, proper solutions. So let's look at um, an educational issue, all right? the connection between ICTs and education. Uh, you, we went through, you, I wouldn't say went through the global pandemic because we do, still do get positive cases here and there, but let's, let's use that term. We went through the global pandemic and um, a lot of children started using digital technologies for education dissemination. But our rural communities just simply did not interact in that manner. And they didn't even have that example to see what people in more urbanized um, communities were doing. They, they, they couldn't juxtapose that. And that big disconnect talks to doing something more than just ICTs. It talks about working in silos and not getting what, what we are saying we want to look at if we look at the um, digital transformation strategy from the AU. We can't fulfill those things because we still have issues like lack of electricity, right? 
and it's 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 a it's a very strange thing to say because we're sitting here and we gathered but we should have those agencies sitting right here with us and having those conversations um we should be speaking quite bluntly about it you know from a town planning perspective what's happening are we accounting for the migration from rural areas into urbanized areas are we speaking to the um economic uh, value that private sector looks at i think quite um, as honorable had just mentioned you know at the end of the day if when, when we speak about these kind of solutions, we need a triple P. Without public-private um, partnerships, we're not going to get anywhere. But we also need to look at what the private sector needs. You know, they're there for profit. They're there for gain. So what are we doing to ensure that there's that um, that filler, that gap, right? So that's, um, I think, my, my little intro to, to this particular session. However, I think some pertinent points... Um, that, that, that I would like us to, to look at for this session, which I did note down, um, just give me two seconds, um, is looking at uh, revolutionizing our conversation, right? I think we've moved from talking about rural communities as completely being disconnected. That's, that's not it. You, you'll find people in the most rural, a village dweller in the most rural, um, rural deepest community who has benefited from telehealth services in some form or another, or who has um, interacted with ICTs, um, whether it be mobile banking, uh, through, sorry, not mobile banking, but um, mobile money uh, as an alternative mobile banking. So the question is, how are we getting people in those communities to be part of these solutions? Right, not just speaking about connectivity or access, but saying how do they create revenue, how do they create literacy, how do they create awareness in their constituencies, so that they want that for themselves, so that they sit here with us and have these conversations. Because maybe just by a show of hands, if I could ask, who is from a rural community in this room? You're from a rural community, so we got one, two, three. Okay, but do you live in a rural community at this point in time? Okay, so we've got one out of so many people. I think the initiatives of, of, of people sitting in our positions right now need to look at integrating the rural voice in here. So I go as a person who wants to help a rural community, but the truth is when it comes to proper solution making, we need to come with a person who's sitting right there in that position, a lived out experience, not just documenting it, but having them speak and telling you what their everyday life is and telling you what the ICTs can do for them after a literacy conversion. And I think that's my submission. I, I, I really do want to take a very human-centric approach and not quote policy um, and speak from the heart because when you spend two weeks in a rural, um, rural village and you're used to having 5G and you go and you can't speak to your family and you can't respond to emails and you can't be connected to the world in the manner that you're used to you realize that this is real life and real people being left behind but also being disconnected from all the development and the leapfrogging that we speak about it's not being actualized and there's definitely more that we can do but at a human centric level thank you so much thank you anyway without much ado i'll hand over to to thank you Hand over to Teres Cater, project manager of Joko Labs. Um, Joko Labs Banjul has been involved in a number of um, connectivity and digital rights activities with our su with support from the Association for Progressive Communication, of which Joko Labs is a member. So, Teres, your intervention and how. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, yeah, so um, at Joker Labs, we um, mainly focus on the awareness raising part and capacity building, on um, letting people know about their rights online, um, trying to help them um, build capacity to use technological de uh, devices. Um, we've worked with Previously, we've worked with um, mostly in the rural communities. Um, we've worked with market women or farmers, um, showing them how to use technology to um, market their produce, for example, using things like WhatsApp. So for people that can't read or write or haven't 
had formal education. So they're able to send voice messages on WhatsApp or take pictures and send it to potential clients um, of their product or produce. We've also um, tried to work with rural youth on creating more local content, um, building like a data repository so we know what, so they know what they have out there so they have that access to information. They know where the hospitals are, where to find a bank, how to open, how to open a bank account, how to, um, where to get forms from if they want to apply for certain things or for, for certain um, public, um, public facilities. Um, we've also, um, we also build capacity in terms of um, staying safe online. So we also work with youth again, um, in rural, rural youth, um, teaching them how to protect themselves online, um, how to uh, not share misinformation, how to, uh, how to protect their privacy, basically their digital um, rights online. We also have, um, again, capacity built of building workshops, uh, raising awareness on um, internet rights and freedoms. So we, we go out there, we tell people, you know, you have a right to this, you need to have access to internet, um, how do you use the technologies, uh, you know, you need access, you have a right to have access to information and this is how we can change your life or this is what we can do for you and you need to demand this so you need to talk to your policymakers. you need to talk to uh, the leaders in your communities and see how you can get this this infrastructure or these these facilities in your communities so that you could um, so that you can better your lives basically I think um, if I might add to that, so, um, one of the main things um, that makes it work with um, Joko Lab's engagement in rural communities in the Gambia is we have to pro provide um, um, the data because um, we have problems with cost of data is about five dollars for one gigabyte of mobile data um, which is one of the most expensive in in Africa and I know our honorable minister here with the new World Bank project coming to Gambia the Gambia is trying to get a second submarine cable I think the best average on data cost in Africa is in Ghana which is about um, 61 cents um, we might not get there yet but we might get to our neighbors in Senegal which is doing about um, $1.75 um, cents for one gigabytes of data so in most of a lot of the money we um, use in, in our work on digital rights in rural Gambia goes into connectivity to get the young people connected and most of them use their mobile phone and recent the data we collected we have 3.5 million mobile phone users in the Gambia, which is over 1 million of the population of the Gambia of 2.5 million. So you can see nearly every household has um, two mobile or three mobile phones. Um, before much much ado, uh, since I have the pleasure of having my Honorable Minister here, um, Usman Bab, the Minister of Communication and Digital Economy, he since he came into office, and I would like to say this, you, 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 we hardly see a lot of um, know little about our ministers. Honorable um, Osman Bab, apart from being a um, information technology sp specialist, um, was working in the um, San Francisco, um, in, involved in transformation architecture, and for, he decided to come back home, not only to come back home, and when he was offered this um, position as a minister, he, to be a minister in Gambia, you have to be um, fully Gambia, no dual citizenship. He relinquished his U.S. citizenship. There are few Africans that will do that. He relinquished his U.S. citizenship to come home to take this position. And since he has been our Minister of Communication and Digital Economy, the first thing he did, which I, I found very laudable, and the whole um, IT ecosystem in the Gambia were very... Um, um, appreciative of was to call all the stakeholders he called all the telcos he called all the, um, the IT association the innovators to hear their story what what are their challenges what are their problems after doing that he now called all the ministries how are you using ICT what are you using it for let them be synergy among the ministries this, this I think that is very commendable and I would like to hear from his perspective why he decided to do that and looking at the way forward what does he see um, in terms of um, 
breaching the connectivity issues we have to address digital rights in Africa. Honorable Ba, sorry I put you on the spot. Thank you. Uh, good morning, everybody. Thank you very much. Yes, you put me on the spot. Uh, but it's all good. Uh, here is, uh, as an African, uh, as a Gambian, uh, it is important that we all look at what is the next 20 years going to look like, Africa, what we want Africa to look like. That is one of the main reasons why I left my 32 years in the U.S. and came back to the Gambia. It is only us who can fix our nation. Uh, nobody will do it for us but ourselves. Uh, uh, going into what do we need to do, I had uh, this young lady from South Africa give a great speech in digital divide and connectivity. Uh, in the Gambia, the first thing uh, that I think we, we, uh, we should do is uh, when I looked at uh, everything that is in place of the infrastructure, is that we have to have an open access. That is, the, that is the main reason why internet is so expensive in the Gambia. Not only just we have a one, sub, sec, a one submarine cable in the country, but also uh, if you look at the GSM operators, uh, as many people have said, they are here to make money. Uh, but they also uh, want to do good for the citizens. It is, our, it is the government responsibility to make sure they empower them and provide them some subsidies so that they can rule some of these uh, roll out some of these uh, uh, connect, uh, connectivity in the rural areas. Because if you look at uh, in the Gambia, in a place like uh, in the rural area, I'll use one example in Basse. If, if you want to put a cell tower in, in that area, minimum it costs you is about 150,000 uh, Gambian dollars, uh, which uh, equivalent to about maybe $1,000 something or 2000 I can't remember. Okay. $3,000. So it's very expensive. So it is the government duty to see how we can help this uh, GSM operator to subsidize some of this so they can be empowered to, rule, uh, to roll out excuse me, these uh, uh, wireless technology out there. But most importantly, it is the open access that's going to uh, help us. Right now, we are in the process, actually. I have drafted a document that I will be presenting to cabinet uh, with the help of my peers to make sure that we give an open access to the N NBN uh, and the uh, ECOAN so that these uh, GSM operators can connect to these networks and let the core GAMTEL, which is our main, our main telecom in the country, uh, see the revenue. I think that is the best way to go now uh, with the supplement of the second submarine cable, which we are working on right now. Uh, hopefully, in the next 18 months, we'll have this in the Gambia. Uh, not to mention a, a tier 4 data center, we are in the process actually securing that as well, uh, which is, uh, you're looking about 36 months for a tier 4 data center to, from start to design to implementation. Uh, Gambia is an incubator, so we welcome everybody to come and explore the, uh, the brains that are there. We have a lot of brains, so we are, we are not asking you know, somebody to, to hand it over to us, but we are asking for partnership and we will, we, will, we will drive, we'll be the driver to get us where we need to be. Uh, a second submarine cable, a data center, which is part of the five pillars I have in my ministry. And the other one is the payment gateway, as we were talking. I was just reading so, uh, some of the uh, processes that are in place as far as getting our payment, uh, national payment gateway switch uh, before end of 2023. Uh, on, on top of that, no country in, on this planet can, can get to where you need to be unless you know how many uh, people are in your country. So we are in the process also engaging other stakeholders in the digital national digital identification card. It is very important, you know, how many people are born in your country, how many graduating, how many re retiring. This is the way you plan your economy. Without that, you can't plan your economy. And the other one is the e-governance. Uh, the e-governance, as great as e-governance, is providing e-services to your citizens. It is important that you have a data center where you can store this data. Because today, if you want to store your data in the cloud for Amazon or AWS and uh, Microsoft or Google, the closest for Amazon you can retrieve your data is South Africa, if you are in Africa, or UK. So it is important, as we Africans, we think about you know, securing, uh, getting our tier four data center as well, so we can secure some of this licensing. 
so we can sell these services to our own Africans within the African continent. On that note, I, I just want to say this. Thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, it is a pleasure to see everybody here, and uh, I am uh, pleased to be here, and hopefully this would be a fruitful uh, delivery. And thank you very much. Thank you, Honorable Minister. I will now um, open the floor for questions, and um, before we do a, um, what do you call it, a closing remark, so I'll open the floor for questions to my panelists. Yes, over to you, Dr. Huda. Okay, hello everyone. I am Huda Shihi from Tunisia. I want to ask how to overcome uh, the gender gap towards connectivity. Is it about uh, coaching or reviewing infrastructure? I'll hand over that to Peace. Thank you. Thank you for the question. And uh, it means that you think that it's an important uh, aspect to be worked on. So I'll just give an, an overview. One, I think we need to take a multi-stakeholder approach when we talk about gender digital divide or digital divide. Uh, we need to involve all these stakeholders in all our approaches. And we need to be very inclusive because when we talk about women, we have women who live with disabilities, women with disabilities, women who live in the rural areas, women who are not educated, you know. So we have all these uh, 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 dynamics, you know, when we talk about women. So that means that this should be reflected in our approach, this should be reflected in our policies, this should be inflected in every step that we take. Uh, the number one thing that I think is very key as well is that we need to do research because we rely on uh, um, uh, global research that have been done and then we miss out, we lack statistics. For instance, I come from Uganda. Right now, if you asked me about the gap that we have, the gender digital di divide gap, I might not have the, the recent statistics. So that means that we need to have research so that we can have, we can know, you can, we can really know which, uh, the number of women who are accessing and their usage, you know, the, the age gap, you know, know all these things so that when we, then it can um, inform our, our our, our our steps it can inform our strategies so I think research is very important one another thing that I think is also very important it, it is education we need to, tr to to change our education system the syllabus is how everything is done we need to encourage women to be in stem because we cannot have women in tech if there are no women doing stem so it's very important that we look at our education system it's very nice that in this room we have uh, different stakeholders people from the government you know uh, we have civil society or tech uh, tech community so it's very important that we look at this and also we need to look at the affordability bit because we know financially women are, are still unable compared to men so and yet for you to use the internet you need to have you need to afford it uh, if you look at women in the rural uh, setting, someone has to buy food, not only in the uh, rural setting, even a woman that lives in the urban area, she has to buy food for the children, and yet she has to also come online to access information, to, to interact, to meaningfully engage. How is this going to be possible? We still have taxes that are levied on the internet uh, data. We still have high taxes that are levied on the devices. So we need to tackle the issues of issue of affordability. And probably we need to also think about some of the affordable means, you know, to, 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 for us to have connectivity, like, uh, like community, uh, community networks. Uh, because we know that the telecos will not put their infrastructures in the rural communities. And yet these are the huge number of communities that are left out. And we have so many women who live in these communities. So we need to look at uh, uh, that as well. And also having relevant content. Everybody will go somewhere because they feel it's something that speaks to them. We need to have this content uh, that, that speaks to women. Women need to come online and find uh, content that give them what they, they are looking uh, for. So I think that is also something that is uh, uh, important and digital literacy. Many times you'll find that women have these phones, but they do not know how to use it. They do not, they do not know how to, to navigate. And where we have interruption like shutdowns, many times when a shutdown is happening, then the women are left out because use of VPNs, you know, how to, to navigate it's, it's usually a challenge, so digital literacy, you know, so these are some of the things that I think would really uh, narrow the digital, uh, the gender digital gap. Thank you. 
welcome. Yes, lady, please introduce yourself and then ask a question. Okay, my name is Christine and I work with Digital Defenders Partnership as a grants officer dealing with the whole Africa. So uh, one thing at uh, Digital Defenders we've realized is that uh, as long as we are, there's achievement of connectivity, there's always pros and cons of everything. So the cons is that, uh, or even the pros, or, or even the challenges that you are facing is that there's a lot of digital threats and our organization is trying to address the digital threats in the space of connectivity. These overwhelming applications that we receive in a week, like uh, up to now for the year to end, we have over 3,000 applications and the grants are not enough in our organization. I don't know what to comment about because as long as you are thinking of connectivity, we must also think about what are some of the challenges and how to be mitigated or even addressed. There's a lot of challenges in the Africa space because most of the, these organizations, however much they're achieving connectivity, they are putting their work online after COVID, they also don't have the structures to mitigate some of the attacks that uh, go alongside with their work online. Thank you. I think um, if if I'm to um, address that question, in, in most in most of the African countries and most places in the global south, we have um, the computer rapid emergency response team that help in terms of threats and stuff like that. But what has happened is that, especially for not-for-profits and digital rights defenders, they don't want to associate in most cases with that body because they think it's a governmental entity. Forgetting that that particular computer rapid emergency response team in your country is made up of different stakeholders. It's made up of the police, it's made up of government entities, it's even made up of the private sectors and telcos. You know, so there needs to be um, a creation of awareness and trust that such um, computer rapid emergency response teams are usually there to support not government systems from being hacked, but the overall community in the country and i will i will say that if um, you practice the model and that's why it's good within internet governance forum what we're doing in, in the gambia national internet governance forum is that we bring all these things to board and we make sure that the police are invited immigration are invited let everybody know you know once you bring all players in the same table everybody will now know that okay something like this exists um, what are the pro pros what are the cons what are the challenges how do we address them but i think we should try as much as possible to develop that trust within the community and such computer rapid emergency response teams thank you karim then we'll go over this yeah. uh, thank you very much uh, uh my name is karim atumani mohammed from comoros um, I'm uh, also a MAG member. This is my uh, third uh, term as a MAG member. Uh, I, I'm also um, uh, a telco operator. I'm the director of regulation and uh, 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 any kind of uh, uh, relation with the government. And uh, I'd like to, to, to add an, uh, an, uh, another point of view or, uh, regarding what uh, was presented by uh, Parliament, Ministry, um, consumer user to say that uh, the reality in terms of access uh, need to be uh, really uh, raised as uh, while user uh, needs uh, access, need connectivity, need quality in terms of implementation in the side of telco, in, in, inside of operator needs investments, needs um, deployment of networks and most of time is need to be linked with the cost of investment. And um, I think that uh, as Global South, as uh, African, I think the, the reality point, uh, pointed here from Gambia is the same uh, for most of our countries in Africa. So we are relying based on the net neutrality uh, concept, we are relying no filtration of traffic, open uh, networks, but the economy of internet um, uh, gives revenue on content provider and platform provider. Uh, end user, while you are looking for 5G networks, when you are looking for broadband connectivity, it's for relaying, connect TV, uh, relaying content and also uh, uh, applications 
provided by uh, Global North, uh, those who are knowing uh, as GAFA. So I think that in Africa, we need to think globally. We need to think together how we can uh, set policy to be able to also involve those who are um, uh, taking um, uh, uh, value or uh, economy uh, on the internet to contribute also on the infrastructure development. Otherwise, this this um, last mile, this uh, um, uh, costly uh, side of the internet, remain on local actors. Uh, in some countries, we put taxes. Uh, I don't know if you remember in Nigeria the uh, 5G frequency auction. Yes, uh, at the end we have one actor who uh, got the, the, the license, but if you see the costs they put on this license, uh, when you will see in terms of network deployment, we will have a lack of um, uh, penetration in those areas who telco uh, uh, knows that they don't have a lot of user so the government our government need to really thinks where we need to have more taxes and where we need that telco go and give network to all citizens but if we can have um, a global thinking <coughs> as african continent I think that we can address th those kind of issue globally and we can have positive impact. Thank you very much. Thank you, Karim. I'll just hand over to um, Dr. Matasek before I take other question from ECA. Uh, th thank you very much. I think it is a very important topic, uh, this discussion uh, under, under IGF. When you talk about digital uh, divide uh, and uh, human rights, it is not uh, something new in, in the continent or in the South. We know exactly what is a problem in Africa, and uh, we know how to do it. But the issue we felt in the implementation side. Let's uh, start. When you talk about digital gap, we have to start by one important point in the continent. It is a digital ID issue. You have 500 million African without any ID. They don't add, uh, have access to the land. They don't have access uh, to school or the, to our social service. The minister talked about the, uh, I think Gambia is on the way to develop their national digital ID. But without this digital ID, we can't develop right policy in the continent because we don't have the right data, the correct data. It is when we have to start our digital ID. Second, infrastructure. You can have an infrastructure, but if you have an infrastructure without device, eh, you, the, the digital gap is there. We have, uh, we have the several examples during the COVID time. In the Caribbean region, we have one country, they have 80% penetration internet. And during the COVID time, 2% access to the device. And, and this, the problem is the same in Africa. 20% of Africa. Hmm? The device costs more than 100% of the monthly income. Hmm? Inacceptable. Hmm? Hmm? To do that, we have to develop our innovation and, and develop also the Africa industry in technology by involving the local private sector. It is a set. The other one, we, 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 there is a, several statistics. We need $100 billion. Huh? to make this access connectivity universal by 2030, but who are going to provide this $100 million? It's not the, the government. Uh, because the government has a lot of other emergency issues like in health, in education, in security. We have to evolve with the private sector. It is uh, The involvement of the private is very important to bridge uh, this uh, digital divide. Second, skill development. We have to develop the skill to develop right policy for skills, and the parliament has a role to play. Yeah? Because as the 2013, we expect 90 90 percent of the job will be on digital, or we'll have a component, digital component. We need to develop the skill of the youth 
as a youth now, uh, by 2050, we have 70 percent of our, our population youth. As a way, the digital divide will be remaining. I think it's very important, and access to internet, it is right now. Yeah, I think your your topic is very interesting, interesting, and we have uh, to discuss more on several issues like uh, digital skill, infrastructure development. Uh, uh, aff affordability also, and the role of the, of the parliamentary is very important, as well as the first, uh, our leadership, if we have a good leadership, uh, we can sort it out to some issue. We have uh, some example in uh, in Rwanda, eh, where with the leadership, they come to sort it out several issues. In South Africa, you have a good example also on the access to device, because 80% have access to the laptop. It is something very inter interesting. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Matasek. Yes, there was hands at this end. Yes, please go ahead, introduce yourself. Okay. <clears throat> Good morning, everyone. This is uh, Tasfai Noai uh, from Ethiopia, from the judiciary. And uh, I, I hope that uh, everyone is enjoying to hear in Addis. Uh, having said that, I want to add uh, some points on the presentations as an Ethiopian, as an African. Um, we want to be sure that uh, uh, our, 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 we need to qualify, we need to clearly spell out our interests because our interests may be, uh, our priorities may be different from, uh, from the global norms. Uh, therefore, we need to clearly put out uh, what should be our priorities. I think our priority uh, should be for the rural people, for the vulnerable people, who should get an access for this uh, digital world. If we are leaving them behind, then it is going to be a problem. Therefore, we need to focus more, I think, on the agriculture, on the small-scale industries, uh, and on the manufacturing, even on the, on the tourism sectors. The second one I want to add is that from the parliamentarians, uh, I think they, their, their, their contribution is very critical, and also from the law enforcement sector. Because in order to ensure, in order to implement the digital rights, the role of the judiciary, the role of the police, the role of the public prosecutor is very high. Therefore, we need to also include on our policies, on our strategies to realize the, 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 the digital rights for the global south. And the third point I want to raise is that the leadership matters. Leadership, political leadership, makes or breaks in ensuring the, digi the digital rights. For example, in Ethiopia, we have, we have Dr. Abiy as a prime minister, and after he came to power, there are different things. Actually, he was like, he is like a, an IT savvy. He's so interested, actually, he was in that sector, and he knows that the benefit of uh, ICT, digital economy, and other things. He come up with a strategy, a strategy digital economy 2025, not only the strategy but also different organizations. Therefore, the leadership should be at the center of this digital uh, rights uh, implementations. Thank you. Thank you very much for that intervention. Before I take um, one, I want to see if there's anyone online that, and we have about 10 minutes, anyone online that has a question, please, um, the guys controlling the Zoom, they let us know. So, what? Yes, go ahead, sir. Okay, uh, thank you very much um, for all the presenters and the panelists. Introduce yourself. Uh, my name is Yobi Satu. Um, I'm from Ethiopia. And I'm the executive director of Organization for Innovation and Sustainable Development Africa. Um, when we come to the point of uh, sessions, um, I mean, I was feeling that uh, we don't have to only uh, innovate on devices and uh, ICTs, uh, but we have to innovate on, on, on policies. So uh, policy innovation is very important uh, concerning your presentations. Um, that uh, uh, when we talk of the rural community and their, their disconnectivity, there are best practices that we can really reach them with affordable price, um, for instance, just um, uh, making an association of uh, rural community in, in a certain uh, village and really uh, disseminating
technologies that are uh, really uh, wireless uh, so that we can easily reach with uh, affordable uh, cost. And um, um, I do think about the issue of government and uh, the infrastructure investment that really government has to uh, invest on physical infrastructures uh, so that uh, this the private um, organizations and the business entrepreneurs can easily reach towards this and disseminate the technologies easily to the community. So um, when I uh, think of the expensive uh, features of the Gambian uh, internet uh, line, it's really surprising for if South Africa is really that much cheap and uh, just when Gambia in that distance makes uh, such lot of um, dollar for one gigabyte. So uh, we have to, we, we need to rethink how to really um, invest on physical infrastructure so that as a government and so that the uh, citizens can really get the right to access to internet. Uh, concerning the issue of, um, I mean, the presentation raised by the South African presenter um, is really uh, very ambitious. And uh, um, my, my concern is internet rights for citizens, uh, that be it in rural or, or urban communities. So um, um, there are also the negative aspects of internet that brought, if we take the case of uh, xenophobia in South Africa, and uh, that's also everywhere now. Uh, so uh, what can you brief us really uh, this is uh, the, in the, the impact of or the impact of internet is minimizing it or how the level of uh, this issue is controlled in South Africa and elsewhere. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, before I will allow um, Zaniwe to answer that question later, before that Madeline Joko Labs wanted, okay, um, Zaniwe and Madeline Joko Labs. Well, we have two hands there. Well, yes, I, um, I will get to you. We still have. Okay, um, uh, thank you for that. I think you raised pertinent points. Um, so I'll go straight to the question that you directed to me around, um, I guess, the decay that um, the internet brings and the dangers. And I think uh, it was Ocean mentioned. So we're looking at, you know, cyber security issues, uh, cyber crimes. Um, going against uh, human rights, dignity, and I mean xenophobia violation, that even manifesting on um, the online space has got a real life consequence. So, if I look at the legislation in South Africa that obviously works hand in hand with development and digital transformation, um, I can confidently say that in my country, um, lo from last year, the 1st of December, Section 20 of our Cybersecurity Act revolutionized the conundrum of um, jurisdiction or being able to find a perpetrator or a suspect of online violations such as xenophobia, hate speech or inciting violence. So what it did really is it connected the disparity that we had with um, IP addresses and utilizing them in the judiciary um, or presenting them um, in, a, in a criminal case or criminal matter for a cybersecurity um, case and, and started using IP addresses. So that really allows us to compel social media platforms to give us more information so we get to the bottom of it. Um, We've had rights and we've had legislation and we had policies that speak to hate crimes, that speak to um, theft, that speak that speak to all sorts of things. Um, so, you know, to say that these legislations will completely eradicate cyber crimes would be remiss of me to say, so I definitely won't say that. But what I can say is that there is something to lean back on and we progressively are closing the gaps on some of the bits and pieces that um, were telling us that, okay, well, you've got a piece of paper, but how do you implement? As Magda said, it's the implementation is the action part. So being able to being open to saying, well, this is the new technology and traditionally the laws would not allow this certain information to help us close cases, to find suspects, that I think is the key. Being open to and learn what we've traditionally been doing and learn new methods of um, um, finding perpetrators, new methods of um, ensuring that the cyberspace is safe. I, I hope that answers you. Thank you. Madeline, then wisdom. Um, good morning, everyone. My name is uh, Madeline. I work at Jokalab Spanjul. Um, I just want to add on to uh, what um, 
Mr. Matao was saying regarding the implementation model that we take when we have to deal with rural communities and what Zen Niwe talked about in terms of the realities that is happening to them. From what I have learned with our experience working with uh, women in rural communities, the, the, the problem all of them will tell you is if you're going to uh, conduct a training for them, how can they make money with this or are you paying them? So the, I, I believe that the model we're all taking uh, can be improved upon because these women are already hard working. They already know how to go about getting their means of livelihood. What we should look at is how can we help them get better at doing the things they do. When we talk about digital rights for them, they might sit with you for a week attending a training, but at the end of the day, what value does it really add on to them? We have to uh, take an approach that can directly impact them uh, by uh, specifically investing in education of their children. Like for instance, uh, we, if, if um, development is happening in urban areas whereby we're building labs for schools and things like that and children in rural areas don't get the same opportunities as those in, 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 in the urban areas are getting, what problem are we really solving? And if we look at also a curriculum when we're taking uh, our kids are learning um, case studies that don't even involve them, how are we teaching them to to solve problems if we are not giving them case studies of problems that is happening within the areas. You take it agriculture, for instance, there's a high amount of produce and at the end of the day, most of the women, their produce goes to waste or they have to sell it at a lower price than what they've actually invested in that. How do we teach the kids, okay, if we have a case study like this, what are the best practices we can do? What are the services that we can provide to them by making sure that what they are learning can is things that are directly impacted them so that they can begin to shift their mindset and look at solutions that can be very much aligned to them. Not teaching them, okay, there's a, there's a plane and this. They don't have planes in their communities moving around, but they have learned and they have soil and they know how to firm. So how can we improve those things for them with the infrastructure that is available before we even begin to talk about their digital rights? What about their basic rights? If we begin to look at that, then we begin to shift the conversations around what is happening so that they can see that development comes from them, not just having to learn and at the end of the day you move to an urban center because that is where the opportunity is. What are the opportunities there for them? Thank you so much. Thank you very much for that divergent um, perspective. Madeline, I think, is very interesting. Wisdom, over to you. Thank you very much. My name is Wisdom, uh, the Executive Director for Africa Open Data and Internet Research uh, Foundation. Yes, I'm going to talk about um, a spectrum. Uh, it looks like uh, we are leaving that out, and then that also plays a critical role in connecting the rural, rural areas. It looks like the licensing that we have only favors uh, the, the big guys, uh, the bigger telcos. And um, uh, if any uh, non governmental uh, uh, organizations um, want to go into the rural areas to, to help them uh, with connectivity issues and all that, uh, most times uh, getting those licensing uh, is very difficult. Um, so if we can look into that, um, if you can uh, look into that uh, so that part of those. Um, uh, spectrum allocation can be made available to then the non-governmental sector so that they can pick up some of this licensing and then go to areas where uh, those big guys uh, uh, don't want to go. The other thing too is that um, we lack data. We need to seriously look into the availability of data. Uh, last mile data, uh, our powers data and all that, we don't have them so it's difficult for someone like me to come into a country and say, okay, I want to help uh, connect the rural communities. Uh, I'm happy to see Steve Song here. Uh, he's done uh, so much work on, uh, I think, data on last miles uh, across the world. Uh, so I don't know if you can share some a bit of information on that. I did some work with him, I think, in 2018 in Ghana or so. Um, so I think that's what I have to say. And then lastly, uh, the other issue too is uh, we need to look at content seriously. I mean, you know, we have various sectors within our countries, and then most time we talk about connectivity, and then we don't look at the content side. What kind of content that the rural connectivity, uh, the rural dwellers uh, need? 
So we need to look at that seriously. If you take a farmer, for example, the kind of content that they need is weather information. So if you are taking a, a, a network to them, and then you add, you add a weather information to it, that can inform them that this season you can begin to farm your produce. That also help them. The another thing is that um, uh, our food that is being produced from the farms are going waste because there is no form of communication. Uh, uh, farmers in the rural areas are not able to find mar uh, uh, marketers online. So these are some of the content that we need to look at. Uh, look at. I have to stop yes, you. For, thank Sorry, you so much. We are running out of time. <laughs> and um, yes, that last intervention, then I will hand over to o Onika um, from the um, we'll take online questions. If there's any question online, then I'd like Onikev, Head of Africa for the Global Inclusion Digital Partnership, to make a brief intervention. Then I'll allow my panelists to say something before we close. Over to you. Hello. Good morning, everyone. My name is uh, Asnaka from Ethiopia. I have a new suggestion. Uh, my suggestion is that we Africans, as a solidarity, we have to strengthen African Network Association in terms of uh, 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 digital rights. And then the second one, we have to appreciate uh, ning young graduate students who have no, uh, no uh, knowledge about digital divide and internet things, so we have to uh, appreciate the ICT and the project management and entrepreneurship skill from African countries and also we have to establish uh, science and technology in terms of uh, African indigenous knowledge so we have to foster young African entrepreneurship skills and before graduates the African students they, they have to take a course like entrepreneurship ICT course and other things thank you Thank you very much. Um, any questions online? Going, going, going. Yes, there's, I think there's an intervention online. Please go ahead. Please, you can read the question for us, um, the online moderator. Or can you speak? I think you can speak. Please, can you unmute them if they are to speak? If anyone wants to speak, the hands are raised. Okay, I'll just hand over to Nika. There's someone. Yeah. Oh, let me give them opportunity. Okay, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Monsieur Chair. Thank you so much. Um, I'm Fadla Adams. I'm with the South African Human Rights Commission. I'm also joined today by colleagues from their respective national human rights institutions throughout Africa and we form part of a digital alliance. Um, if I may just, and I know I don't have much time, but just to say that we can't have this conversation without recognizing the integral role that NHRIs play. We serve as an interlocutor, we are independent, most established, um, or we're supposed to be established under the Paris Principles, which is under the auspices of uh, the UN. But just to indicate that there is a lot of conversations happening within our respective countries, but I don't hear much coming through where tech companies or even government entities are engaging with their national human rights institution. And that's critical in the formulation of policy, analysis of legislation. I can pick up on gaps in the room around discussions where what's happening in the NHRI is not maybe being transmitted to tech companies, so there is a gap. Um, we too have presence on the ground um, in terms of engaging rural communities and particularly there was a question around xenophobia and hate speech and within the NHRI context we are responsible for certain activities within our government context we advise or we push for the implementation of a national action plan against racism or on racism uh, some of our NHRIs have done work on social media and racism um, within the South African context, we have, with our complaints handling mechanisms, a hired IT forensic specialist to track persons who post inflammatory comments online. And we have taken them to the Equality Court. Um, it's just unfortunate that we don't find human rights, enough human rights narrative coming through in these discussions. And I would really encourage um, your respective governments or, or agencies that are here 
to engage with your national human rights institutions. We do have speaking rights at the United Nations as well. So that if you are categorized as an A status NHRI, so that gives an opportunity to really speak to the issues that your country is facing on the ground and what kind of change needs to happen. So it's just a recommendation very quickly from my side. I, I am available afterwards and I'd like to speak to my South African sister, please. <laughs> and I see a colleague online uh, that I know. Hi, Isaac. Thank you so much, Che. Uh, yeah, thank you very much. I think that is that is very necessary. We, within our national internet governance um, forum in the Gambia, we our um, national human rights commission is still very new. It's about three years old now, but they are always involved. And I think is what you just mentioned is good to involve all these people in the discourse. And um, that was a very good intervention. Onika, over to you now. Great. Uh, thank you. Uh, thanks for this opportunity. So uh, global digital. Inclusion uh, partnership, you might know our work as uh, formerly the Alliance for Affordable Internet. So that will give you just kind of that uh, framework. So just a couple of things. I'm, I think, you know, I agree with pretty much most of what has been said today. Uh, so for me, I think the issue of policies, I mean, we have a $109 billion dollar gap in infrastructure investment that's required in order to connect everyone in the continent. Globally, that's something like $480 billion. Even if government, uh, even if private sector could provide 50% of that, government has to come uh, and make a commitment towards this digital development investment, as well as private pub public partnerships and our development uh, agencies. So a multi-stakeholder approach towards investment is also uh, quite critical to get us uh, to this universal access. On affordability, there, there's several policies that are beginning to erode some of, of the gains we've made in some of the countries. One of them is this growing trend of digital taxation, and I'm talking specifically about taxes that face consumers. Uh, communication service tax, e-levy, e e uh, taxes on, on digital transactions, those are consumer-facing taxes and are actually now making connectivity even more uh, un un unreachable, including for countries that may have uh, met the one for two affordability standard. We absolutely have to build the demand side issues. This usage gap is about two things. It's about affordability, but it's also about the demand side issues, such as investing on digital skills and making sure that we have affordable devices. In this continent, when we did uh, an affordability uh, uh, research on devices, we found that people were spending 40 to 60 percent to be able to afford an entry level smartphone in some of the markets. And that's the cost of a microwave in some countries. And as you can imagine, buying this for one individual to utilize in a household can be quite cost prohibitive. So we do need to talk about local assembly. We need to talk about local manufacturing. We need to have a conversation with the manufacturers around this, but also the import duty uh, taxes that are levied on uh, these devices that are imported. And lastly, uh, there's still a lot on that, you know, infrastructure policies, sharing, po infrastructure sharing policies, spectrum, allocation for community networks and you know different financial models but I just want to quickly touch on this gender issue uh, this growing digital gender gap which is quite concerning it's about affordability but it's also about safety issues women especially uh, female politicians and journalists we find that uh, women who are very active online select to be less active online because of the violence that is that they experience when they are online so we we have to address this issue of online gender-based violence. It's no different from uh, the inequities that women experience in real life. In 2018, we, 2016, we convened the first Africa Summit on Women and Girls in Technology, where we brought women who work at the intersection of technology and policy. And they came up with a framework on how we deal with gender inclusion. And, and their framework basically instructs us that we have to take a rights based approach, so it's a react framework. Rights based approach, focus on education, it's really important. And perhaps in addition to STEM, we look at STEAM, including arts and humanities in our frame in our uh, model towards getting girls in in in, uh, in technology. Uh, so S uh, react R E. Uh, so rights, education, access, and that's the affordability issues, the safety issues, all fall on that. Content, 
absolutely important. We have to have relevant content. The internet cannot just be social media and the internet cannot just be English reading. Very, very important for making sure that we are being inclusive in our communities. And lastly, but not least, we have to set targets. These inequalities exist because we have unequal societies. And COVID actually exposed our inequalities. So we have an opportunity to set very clear and realistic target of how we are going to reach the people we have not reached so far and mainstream gender in all of our ICT policies and beyond ICTs as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Anika. And um, I will make my um, panelists make two minutes of uh, closing interventions, and we end this session for the Halaji you starts. Yes, um, thank you very much um, once again um, for the opportunity. And uh, my closing remarks would be al along the lines of how do we close the gap in the Global South. I think number one is the political commitment. And when I talk about political commitment here, we're talking about governments. If you go back to our own countries, I would like you to check on how much money is actually allocated to the ministries that are responsible for digital innovation or digital economy. Take a look at that. And then also compare and see how much money are they contributing to GDP. What they're giving them is actually pittance. So it is the responsibility of all of us as citizens to ensure that our governments give those ministries the right amounts of money or budgetary allocation to be able to do their work. And in doing so also, there are responsibilities they also have in terms of basic infrastructure. You know, we are talking about um, almost you know, 19 or 20 percent of people uh, are only connected. But the same amount of people also do not have access to electricity. So they go hand in hand. So if there is no electricity, I can tell you connectivity also will be an issue. Now, what do we do with that also? Now, the governments actually should be ensure, to ensure that they provide electricity. And when that actually happens, they will ensure that the private sector will be able to also to provide the other services. Because it's going to be very expensive for the private sector uh, that actually invest to provide electricity and also to build mass on their own. And that would also make the internet connectivity more expensive. Because again, those are operational costs. The other area is also about the policy. The policy that the minister actually is going to, to do in terms of shared services. How can each telecom build their own mask they don't want to share with anybody. That makes everything actually more expensive. And, and I'm glad that our Honorable Minister actually is in line to ensure that we have that kind of policy where institutions can actually share services, data center, or otherwise to make the cost um, uh, uh, reduce. The third one is always about education and capacity building. You know, in the global south, you go to many of our schools, basic secondary schools, they do not have access to internet or they do not actually even teach the curriculum in internet uh, or the technology. They don't. So we need to build from there. Let's look at our curriculum and then change the curriculum to reflect our aspirations. Unless and until we change our curriculums, we're going to find it very difficult because the industrial levels left us behind. And if you don't mind, this digital transfer is also going to leave us behind. So let's ensure that our curriculum is actually changed. And lastly, also, I think our governments, we need to work very closely with the private sector to ensure that um, they, they support them in areas where they can actually provide. Because again, the private sector, they're there to make money even though they have that kind of component where they would actually provide access. But the community networks, they need to do something to support them, whether it's going to be policy, whether it's going to build some kind of infrastructure to support them, I think they need to do that. Um, uh, so I'll, I'll just end it like that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so thank you, everyone. Um, so what I want to focus on is um, the inclusion and so using inclusive language to make sure that everybody understands, um, especially with technology, understands the technology they're using, understands um, what they're doing. So yeah, so we need to make sure that if we're trying to build capacity or educate people on these technologies that we use things that are relatable to them, that are relatable to their societies or their communities. I also wanted to sp um, speak about the risks because with connectivity comes risks. Right, um, people need to know, or they, we need to know what's happening with um, our data, and we, they need to know what um, our our rights, especially like, especially like when it comes to what's happening with our data, what we share online. So, um, especially since um, there's a huge percentage of young people that use the internet now. Uh, they don't know what they're sharing. They don't know what happens to the information that they're sharing. So um, we need to make sure we use um, simple or under inclusive language to make sure that um, to raise awareness, to know 
um, to teach them what they're doing, um, what happens to their data, where it goes. Also with um, privacy settings, especially with um, tech com with big tech companies, um, to know what to share, what not to share. Um, I also think that they should, um, big tech companies should have those privacy settings by default. Um, we also need, I think, a common data protection act. So maybe from like the Africa Union, we can have a common data protection act that um, can be implemented by AU member states. So yeah, basically. Peace and um, there's a question online. If the person can, oh, okay, um, okay. Thank you. Uh, it's been a very informative uh, discussion. And I think we seem to all have consensus around policies. Uh, but maybe we need to look at the issue of policies uh, differently. We have a lot of policies, laws. We have, I think, very good uh, legal frameworks. I have looked at a couple of uh, laws in different African countries, and I think we have them. But what we need to talk about is the implementation. We need to uh, evaluate these policies that we have. Because if we were evaluating the policies that we already have, then we would see the gaps. Then all the reports that we would regularly you know, have, we would see them. And then it would push you know, the, the reforms, you know, the you know, amendments, and this sort of thing. So I think uh, for me, <coughs> Honorable and her, they've already talked about uh, this. Uh, uh, recommendations and when I was re uh, uh, getting back to you I think I, I pointed out all that but I think I just want to reinforce that we need to e uh, evaluate the implementation of the policies that we already have so that we look at reforms and maybe am amendments and know the gaps thank you yes Huda you had something to say yes, maybe maybe we need the ambassador to par region to give us what are the, per the connectivity problem because it will be a bit uh, difficult to, to cover the connectivity problem per uh, continent or per country. Thank you. The person online, if the question can be read. If not, I will move to Dr. Matasek. And I would like, since we have our honorable minister here, I would like him to say a closing remark. Dr. Matasek, closing remark. Uh, thank you very much, sir. It was uh, an exciting session. And uh, we learned a lot uh, during this session. And we have also several ideas uh, from this session. The role of the, the commitment of the government is very important, mm, I'm sure, as well as we need to focus on the infrastructure, on the content development, on the skills, because uh, uh, without this, con in Africa, we have uh, 2,200 2, language. And we, have, we are only 2% on the content of internet. We have something to do. And as ECA, we are going to follow the recommendation of this session. We have uh, several initiatives uh, uh, to respond uh, to the digital uh, gap in the continent. We have this uh, digital center of excellence on digital ID, digital trade, and digital economy. We launched recently in uh, March 2020, this year, the African Research Center on Artificial Intelligence. Cyber security is very important for the continent because cyber, cyber crime costs 10% of our GDP. And also we have several issues in the region, in the Sahel region, why we decide in collaboration with the government of uh, Togo to establish a research center and coordination of, on cyber security in Lome. And we also uh, adopt this uh, Lome declaration this year to see how African country will fight against cyber security. Yesterday we launched the report on cyber security in the foreign cell revolution and tomorrow we are going to re launch the cyber security mo model guideline and we are here to support all in the digital skill also we are we are working with Rwanda to develop a steam center as well as we are focused on the global digital contact all the issue discuss uh, here, we are going to raise it in the digital compact to a common with one voice on uh, with for Africa. As you know, the, for for the information for the minister, it will be it will be organized a ministerial summit in 2023 on the global digital compact, and we need African country to be ve very involved. ECA is there, and uh, it will support all African country to bridge this digital divide for the achievement of the. UN Sustainable Development Goal 
2030 and the target of African Union AU 2063. Thank you very much. And I acknowledge again the presence of the Minister. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Mata Sek from the ECA. I hand over to our Honorable <coughs> Minister, Usman Silla. Closing remarks, please. Usman <laughs> Basari. Uh, thank you very much, everybody. Uh, this is my first time attending, attending such a uh, meeting. Uh, I think everybody that is here has uh, something to take with them in terms of uh, what is the next step. Uh, we gather in some of these things. We talk a lot about initiatives, you know, a lot of great things. But at the end of the day, what do we do with it? So uh, I encourage everybody that is uh, in this meeting or that has attended this meeting, uh, from the notes you have gathered uh, verbally or in writing, please uh, share, the, share your email uh, uh, with everybody so that we can get some feedback on what's the next step from here and some recommendations. So we are always open to that. I think that's very important. Whenever we are in these meetings, uh, it's important we have something to take with us to uh, make good use of. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Honorable Minister Usman Ba, Minister of um, Communication and Digital Economy de Gambia. We, we are very grateful for you to attend this session. We are very grateful to all our online participants and all participants here present. Um, my email and information is on the um, IGF website of, of this session on behalf of all my colleagues from Joko Labs, Banjul, who are here present for this session. It's a discussion that um, continues. We have to discuss it. We have to get our parliamentarians involved. We have to get our ministries involved. And we have to take part in our National Internet Governance Forum. Whether it's, whether it's When it exists, make sure you are part of this discussion. That is the only way we can build an Africa and we can get solutions for the Global South in terms of aligning connectivity with um, the dig digital rights. So thank you very much. Have a blessed day and see you soon. Please, uh, all the all the Gambians here. We have our minister. We have to take a, a photo with him before he goes. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. 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 Hey, <laughs> <laughs>